All right, here we go. Uh, this one should be a little, uh, little shorter than the last one, all right? Today we're going to learn about impulse and momentum. All right, a lot of this is going to be a review from what we did last year. Uh, basically, the addition here is going to be cal some calculus stuff, all right? So uh, linear momentum. So uh, hopefully you remember linear momentum is defined as mass times velocity, all right? Remember, we used uh, the lowercase letter p to stand for momentum. All right, and uh, remember, this is one of those things I, I commented uh, in honors probably a bunch of times that it's kind of a weird thing because it's not something that you can give a simple definition of, right? Like you couldn't explain this to a third grader, um, you know, different from any of the other things we've talked about this year, right? So uh, really, the best definition of momentum is mass times velocity, all right? Um, so a couple things to remember. It's a vector. Uh, it points in the same direction as the vector. In fact, I don't know if I've ever explicitly said this. Anytime you multiply a vector by a scalar, the answer always points in the same direction as the original vector. Okay, um, that's actually really important in this chapter. So, like when you look at net force equals mass times acceleration, your net force and your acceleration are in the same direction, right? If you look at uh, displacement is average velocity times time, your displacement is in the same direction as your velocity. Okay. So anytime you multiply a vector, a vector by a scalar, your answer is in the same direction as the vector. Okay? Very important thing in this chapter. All right. Um, so, um, I guess the other thing then, back from my tangent now, the other thing to be aware of, uh, the only way that you can change momentum is if you have a net external force, right? Because the only way you're going to change your momentum is if you change your velocity, and the only way to change velocity is with a net external force. Okay, so um, when Newton first expressed Newton's second law, so we learned uh, that Newton's second law says net force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, um, Newton didn't write it that way. Newton wrote his second law by saying that the net force on an object is the rate of change of momentum. Okay. He said that it's the rate of change of momentum, all right? So let me kind of show you a little bit more about why that's true, all right? So let's, first of all, let's look at a, a situation where uh, mass and the net force are constant, all right? So here's the deal. If you want to change the momentum of an object, you have to change the velocity. If you want to change the velocity, you have to have a net force, all right? So let's see. So what do we got? So change in momentum. Well, by definition, change in momentum is Final momentum minus initial momentum, right? That's what change is. Final minus initial. Oh, well, that's the mass times the final velocity plus the mass times the initial velocity. Oh, I can factor out an M. This becomes M times VF minus VI, right? Oh, shoot. I put a plus in here. Here we go. Sorry about that. We're subtracting, not adding. Um, okay, so mass times VF minus VI. All right, well, remember, acceleration is Vf minus Vi over T. So if I multiply both sides by T, I can replace this, the Vf, oh, sorry, you can't see what I'm pointing at. Vf minus Vi is just At, right? So this is M times At. Uh, I can regroup my parentheses. Ma times T. Oh, Newton's second law tells us that mass times acceleration is net force. Ah, all right, and so we call this net force times time, we call it impulse. All right, and the symbol for impulse is a capital letter J. So here's our impulse. Symbol for impulse is J. Here's our uh, change in momentum. All right, and they're equal. All right, so in fact, in honors, when we did this last year, I didn't even really use the symbol J, right? Because impulse and change in momentum are, as this shows us, they're equal, right? Okay, so change in momentum is impulse. Change in momentum is change in momentum. Impulse is, and they're all equal, okay? So last year, we did a ton of problems where we used this to solve, right? 
Okay. So the only thing that's going to be different this chapter, this year, is that this all works if your net force is constant. So we got some calculus under our belt. We're going to figure out what happens if our net force is not constant. Okay. So, well, let's see. What happens then? All right. Well, so graphically and calculosally, uh, here's what we've got. So for a fixed force, suppose we've got an object uh, and there's a fixed force on it, all right? So what that means is as time progresses, the amount of net force on your object is not going to change, right? So, you know, maybe you've got a thing that has a net force of, I don't know, let's say 10 newtons. Okay. Well, then, if I want to figure out after five seconds, if I want to figure out how much the momentum has changed, change in momentum is net force times time. It's just going to be 10 times 5, right? It's the same as the area of this rectangle, right? Ah, area. That means integrate, right? Okay. If your force is changing, you can still integrate. Maybe you've got a variable force, okay? So if I want to find my impulse here, I can't just do force times time because it's changing, but you can still integrate, find your area, okay? And so what this is showing us, what we are learning here, is this. Change in momentum, a.k.a. j, is simply the integral of your net force with respect to time, from time initial to time final. Okay. Notice it's a definite integral, right? Because we're talking about change. Okay. So this is going to be the new thing. I should probably comment, last chapter, we were doing work and energy, right? Last chapter, we learned that work was the integral of force. But remember, that was dx, not dt. Okay, so please make sure you are very careful about this distinction. Okay, if you integrate force with respect to time, it gives you change in momentum. If you integrate force with respect to position, it gives you work. Very, 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 very important. Okay, so don't get those mixed up. Okay, um, let's see. So, uh, this basically just says everything that I just said. Um, we talked about the impulse momentum theorem. Uh, I already gave you this. This should be net force. Okay, cool. All right, so I want to do two examples. First of all, I want to do one example that has some kind of vector work on it. And then I also want to do a second example that really focuses on the fact that your change in momentum doesn't depend on force, it depends on net force. Okay? So, um, here we go. All right. So, first example. So, we've got a 0.2 kilogram, 0.28 kilogram volleyball. It's directly above the volleyball net. It's moving horizontally at 12 meters a second. Let's write out our givens here. So we know that our VI is uh, 12 meters per second in the I direction. When a player hits the ball back the way it came from with a force whose magnitude is given by, and then you give him this force. So force from the person is 10,000. Let's say 10 to the fourth times 7.2t minus 240t squared. So the amount of force the person is exerting on the ball changes with time. Okay? Um, and it's exerted at 60 degrees below the horizontal. All right, so we need to make a decision here because the velocity and the force are working against each other. All right, so let's do this. Um, let's assume that the ball is initially moving in a negative direction. And that way we can make our force the kind of this way-ish, forwards and down, okay? That way the x component of our force will be positive, all right? Now, the problem tells us that uh, this is all going to happen for 3 seconds, sorry, 0 0.03 seconds, and we want to find the final velocity of the ball, all right? And I guess we should jot down the next. All right, so to be clear, we really, you could have solved this uh, before, because if you take 
we know our net, or we know our force divided by the mass that will give you the acceleration, and then you can integrate acceleration to find your change in velocity. And I want you guys to learn how to do it this way too, because I think there's value in understanding both of them. All right, now uh, the size of this force is, is pretty significant. Uh, you know, it's got a, mag a magnitude of order 10 to the fourth. So we're going to assume the effects of gravity are negligible. To be 100%, this is a little bit sloppy. Um, but for the purposes of this example, we're going to not worry about that. Okay? So the force that the player is exerting for the purpose of this example is going to be our net force. Okay? All right. So um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out how much the momentum changes. Okay? If we can figure out how much the momentum changes, then we can figure out how much the velocity changes. And since we know our starting velocity, we can find our ending velocity. All right, so that's the path we're going to take to get this answer. All right, so, um, so the first thing we're going to do is figure out how much did the momentum change by. So our change in momentum is, well, that's the integral of our net force with respect to time. And this is all occurring from the instant his hand makes contact with the ball until the instant it leaves the person's hand. Okay, that's an S there, 0 0.03 seconds. No, I just made it look more like a 5. Whatever, that's an S. Okay, so this is the integral from 0 to 0 0.03. Um, I'm going to put the 10 to the 4th outside, because it's just a constant. And then I'm just going to integrate 7.2t minus 240t squared dt. Okay, uh, so let's see. Integrate. So what do you have to integrate to get, or what do you have to take the derivative of to get 7.2t? It's going to be 3.6t squared, right? So we've got 10 to the fourth times 3.6t squared minus, what do you have to take the derivative of to get that? It's like 80t cubed. And then we want to evaluate at 0 and 0 0.03. So if you plug 0 in, you're just going to get 0. So I just got to plug in the 0 0.03. So if you plug in 0 0.03 here and here, you end up getting 10.8. Okay? Um, and the units are uh, newtons 10 seconds. All right. Remember that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So that's the same as a kilogram meter per second. Okay. Um, if you need a review on that, it's in the notes from last year. Okay, so that's our change in momentum. So our change in momentum is 10.8 kilogram meters per second. But remember, it's a vector. What direction is it pointing? Well, remember a minute ago, we just said, all right, it's a change in momentum is net force times time. Ah, so my change in momentum is in the same direction as the uh, net force. And the change in velocity is in the same direction as that. So all three of these vectors are going to always point in the same direction. Your change in momentum, your change in velocity, and your net force all point in the same direction. Okay. So let's do this. Let's find our change in velocity. Change in velocity is change in momentum over mass, right? Just by rearranging this dude. So we're going to get 10.8 over 0.28. And it gives us a number that's written somewhere on my paper here, 38.6 meters per second. And now I'm going to put in the direction at 60 degrees below the horizontal. All right, this way, remember? Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write that in unit vector notation. Okay, so my change in velocity is, if I take this and, you know, draw the vector and find the components, you guys all know how to do that by now. So that's negative 19.3i minus 33, oh, sorry, positive, 0.4j meters per second, right? And then our initial velocity was negative 12i meters per second. So add them up, that'll give you your final velocity. So the final velocity then is going to give us, uh, what, 7.3i 
the minus 33.4 J. And there's a second. And then obviously you can you know, use your vector addition to put that back together. And it gives you whatever the answer was up at the top of the page. I, for some reason, did not write it down. Uh, but yeah, so if you, you know, draw on your components, you end up getting way back up here. Here you go. 34 meters a second at 78 degrees below the horizontal. Okay. All right. Now, so that example, the intent there was just to kind of help you understand how to deal with two things. One, dealing with the variable force. Two, uh, dealing with the, the sort of the vector aspect of momentum, change in momentum and impulse. All right. This next example, I really want to focus on the fact that your change in momentum is determined not by a force, but by a net force. Okay. So in this one, we've got a volleyball falling again, but this time the magnitude of the force that's acting on the volleyball is significantly smaller. Okay. Um, so this time we're going to have to take into account gravity. All right, so what we've got is a volleyball that's being dropped from rest from a height of 12 meters. All right, and then at the end of those 12 meters, it's caught by Roy, who exerts a force on it to stop it. Okay, and it says how much time is required to stop the ball. Okay, so let's let's first of all figure out what happens while it's falling. Well, this is just a conservation of energy problem, right? Let's see, the GPE it starts out with before he drops it is all going to become kinetic energy when he has these right before he catches it. So we've got mgh equals one half mv squared. Cancel your m's. Multiply. Your v is going to be the square root of 2gh. So for us, that's the square root of 2 times 9.8 times 12 meters. Don't forget to square root it. And you get 15.3 meters a second. And it is going down. All right? So. What we want to do is we want to find the time required to stop the ball. All right. So I'm, even though my force isn't constant, I still kind of think in, in terms of this. All right. And so the idea is here we're looking for the time. So that means I know everything else. All right. So let's resolve this side of the equation. Okay. The only difference is for us, because our force is not constant, we've replaced this with that integral. Right? It's still the same idea. Okay? So uh, let's find our change in momentum. Okay? So our change in momentum is the mass of the volleyball times Vf minus Vi. So the mass of the volleyball is 0.28 kilograms. Roy is going to stop the volleyball from an initial velocity of negative 15.3 meters a second. So our change in momentum turns out to be. 4.29 kilogram meters per second. All right. So now we got to find out how much time is required to stop the ball. Well, so what we know is we know that change in momentum is the integral of our net force with respect to time, right? And we know our change in momentum is 4.29. So the question is, how long does it take? Well, then I'm going to integrate from time zero until whatever the time is at which it stops. So let's call Ts the time at which it stops. All right? But we have to figure out what's going on with our net force. So here's the deal. Here's the volleyball. It's got a mass of 0.28 kilograms. What force is around? Well, the gravity is pulling it down. The force of gravity is 0.28 times 9.8, which is 2.744. And then there's the upwards force from Roy, which is 20t. So my net force is the sum of those. Okay, so coming back over here, we're now integrating from 0 to ts. It looks like we've got 20t minus 2.744, right? That's my net force, dt. Okay. So, impulse depends on net force, all right? The only reason that I was able to ignore the gravity in the first problem was because the magnitude of the force was so much larger, right? Because you have that 10,000 tacked onto the front. 
Okay. And again, even there it was a little sloppy because the time was small. But anyway, in general, you need to take into account all of the forces. Um, okay, so let's integrate this. So this, let's see, integral of 20t is just 10t squared. Integral of 2.744 is 2.744t. And then we want to integrate it from 0 to ts. So plug it in, and we get 10 times the time at which it stops squared minus 2.744 times the time at which it stops. Oh, and that whole thing equals 4.29. So now subtract 4.29, and then use the quadratic formula, and you'll find that the time at which it stops is uh, 0.80. I can't read my own writing, so I don't know if it's another 0 or a 6. So we're going to just leave it like that. <laughs> All right, so there's your time to stop.